Well, good evening. Good to see you here tonight. One day after Christmas, and uh, good to see you in the service this evening. Well, we appreciate Brother Yoder and appreciate 1040 International and uh, what God is doing there and the different fields that opened up. One of those fields that opened up this last year or this year of 2018 was Uganda, and uh, Brother Yoder was there and uh, met Pastor Amos, I won't say his last name, uh, M, M, what? <laughs> M, it's M-W-E-B-A-Z-A, I think, or something like that, isn't it? Memboza? Pastor Amos is what I call him, and uh, he's, a, he's a zealous young guy, he really is. He's, he doesn't lack in zeal at all, he just needs some knowledge. He just needs some teaching, and uh, Dr. Yoder spent, in addition to, you know, that uh, you'll see pictures of, and I'll explain to you, he spent quite a bit of time just personally with him, and we've continued to do that uh, at least maybe every other week or so by video conference and video call, and uh, he tries to help him with questions and things that he has, and uh, just uh, looking forward to what God's doing there, and we've, uh, good things are happening, but great things happened while he was there for several weeks, and uh, many souls came to know Christ as their Savior, and I'm excited to have him share with you what the Lord did there. He'll, he'll be ready to answer any questions you have as well, if you have some, and then he's going to go ahead and bring a Bible study for us tonight as well. So, Dr. Yoda, you come, and the rest of the service is yours. Well, it's a joy to bring to you the information of the things that happened in Uganda. Uh, this isn't on yet. Are we working now? Okay, amen. So, again, it's a joy to be able to bring to you a report from what happened in Uganda. Uh, it was more than what we could have imagined, and uh, you'll see that on the video. On the video, there's a couple places where I just have pictures. There's no talking or no music, so don't panic and everybody point at Dean. That's just the way that it is. But uh, there's a couple things on there that I want you to understand at the end, I give a few statistics of people that were saved while I was there. And uh, initially, some people would say, oh, that, that's not possible. But I want to remind you that we had access to the schools. We were in seven schools while we were there. And the children were basically on the edge of their seat listening to what we had to say. And if uh, that was legal in America, we'd see hundreds of kids saved in schools every year here in America. But we wait until their minds are hardened to sin, and then we try to reach them for Christ. And uh, we'll, we'll pay for that someday. But um, the Lord was able to just do some amazing things. And I'm going to explain one thing before I show the video. Um, during that time, when I left Columbus, there was the hurricane that was going on on the East Coast. And so I was praying that I'd be able to make my flights, and I got to the airport there in Columbus, and I had a one-hour flight delay, a two-hour flight delay, and that took me to within 15 minutes of when my plane would leave for Belgium. So I got on the plane, they, I, I waited in this line to redo my flights. And they said, if we could redo your flights for you, but you're not gonna get to Newark, New Jersey any faster than if we just let it go. And I, and I told them, I said, well, I'm trusting the Lord, let's just let it go. So I got on the plane and I, I got to, uh, we landed there. When we landed there, there was no rain even at the airport at that time. It was incredible. And the steward, stewardess came down the aisle and she said, okay, anybody that has any problems with their tickets, raise their hand and uh, let me know. So I raised my hand and she came back because I was sitting all the way at the back of the plane. And she looked at me and said, uh, sir, I I'm very sorry but there's no way that you can make this plane. When, when I actually got there, I had 15 minutes 
before my plane was to depart. Not, not to board, to depart. And it was on time. It was on schedule. And she said, sir, the, the, the place that you have to check in is at the farthest terminal, but before you get there, you have to ride a bus. And she said, the problem is, there's only one flight that leaves for Belgium per day, and so I don't know what to tell you. I'm very sorry. So I said, tell me again the directions that I need to catch this bus. You know, and so she's like, go left, go right, go downstairs. You know how it is, you're confused. So I get off the bus, or I, I, get, I get off the airplane. Man, I was really confused. <laughs> I didn't know whether I was on a bus or a plane. No. Um, I got off the airplane, and I, I ran to the bus thing, and as soon as I got there, the bus pulled away. And there, was, there was another bus that came, but it was loading another area. It was not loading my area. So the third bus that came, I got on it, and now it was time for my plane to leave, and I just got on the bus. When I got on the bus, the driver got off. And he went in the terminal, and he wasn't doing anything. He was just talking with his friends. And I'm <laughs> I was getting a little excited. Uh, so, so he got on finally and drove us there, and... The stewardess, she had explained where my terminal was. It was the farthest one down. And so I got off the, the bus, and I, I started thinking to myself, what's, what's the point? Why, why rush now? It's already over. And the, the Lord just told me, he said, uh, Brother Yoda, you've got to do your part too. Uh, so <laughs> I, I had my luggage, and I started running. I mean, I was running, and I, I put O.J. Simpson to shame, and uh, I was going so fast, I was swerving around people, I was, I was going everywhere, and uh, I finally, I made it all the way down to the very last terminal, and I got to the desk, there was a guy there, there was no people there, and he said, uh, well, this isn't the one, you have to go to this desk over here. So I went just uh, a little bit to my right, just to, you know, maybe... 50 yards or whatever, and uh, there was a big long line there. So I started waiting in this line, and I stood in line for probably three or four minutes. And so now it's way past the time for my plane to leave, and I thought, this can't be right. My plane's already supposed to be gone. What's this big long line for? So I got out of line, and I went over to the first desk beside me, and he said, well, this is your plane right here. Go ahead and get on. And so I, I ran down the, uh, the, the aisle there that goes to the plane, and I got on the plane, and I'm putting my luggage up into the thing, and it starts backing away from the terminal. So while I, I got on the plane and I'm putting my luggage up in the rack, the plane's backing up. I was the very last person on the plane. And why they were waiting, they don't know, but he knows. And so I got on a plane, and I met my partner over there in Belgium, and then we went down to uh, Uganda, and the Lord just blessed right away. So uh, we're going to go ahead and show the video, and then dir directly after the video, if you have some questions concerning the trip, um, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. Pastor Amos Mwebaza as the answer to many prayers. Pastor Amos' situation was unique due to the fact that he desired to live by correct biblical doctrine but had little Bible training. Because of this, a trip was planned to go and help Pastor Amos in Kampala, the capital city in the country of Uganda. The Lord's hand was upon this trip before I left America. Hurricane Florence caused severe delays in flights, but the Lord opened a way for me to meet all my flight connections even after the airline said it was impossible. Because of the goodness of God, 
I entered Uganda safely with my luggage and travel partner Kevin Riley. Upon arrival, we were greeted by Amos, National Pastor of Kampala Independent Life Baptist Church. We knew from the beginning that he needed much help in the spiritual and physical organization of his church. However, we did not know how desperately he was in need of Bible training. The country of Uganda has been saturated with Pentecostal and charismatic influence above and beyond imagination. In order to make things biblically correct, we had to establish all basic doctrines using our King James Bible as the authority. This was accomplished verse upon verse with one-on-one -on -one personal Bible study, nearly daily pulpit preaching, intensified conference training, and question and answer sessions which were both personal and public. During our first week in Kampala, we received permission to speak in two public schools, went street and door-to-door -door soul winning, and held a three-day pastor's conference in the Kasisi region, specifically Rugendra Barba in the west side of Uganda. While in Kasisi, we met Pastor Joseph and Assistant Pastor Tony David. Although this assembly was functioning as a local church, it needed much doctrinal training. It alarmed us that in a conference with 38 pastors and more than 20 church leaders, there were only nine Bibles. The people truly wanted to know the truth. However, they simply did not have it. The emphasis during the pastor's conference was on the authority of scripture and doctrinal foundations of the Christian life. The preaching was a blast of fresh air since the Pentecostal method is based on feeling and emotion rather than truth. In the evening hours after the pastor's conference we held open air preaching crusades. Although Ugandans speak a form of English, it is not their native language. Therefore, all preaching went through a translator to better communicate in the people's native tongue. In each location we visited, the Lord provided a man who was proficient in both languages, so nothing was miscommunicated. Proper translation is vital when explaining biblical doctrine. I would like to explain what happened at our first outdoor crusade meeting. The members of New Hope Church began gathering a crowd an hour and a half before I was scheduled to preach. With the crowd at its highest point, and as I began my first sentence, all of the power to the microphones stopped. Furiously, the men of the church tried regaining the power, but it met with no success. So I lifted up my voice and began preaching the way I have for years on American streets. To the glory of God, 22 were saved during the invitation. The men of the church said that power outages like this one had happened before. Not knowing what to do, they simply discontinued the meetings. By the Lord allowing the power to fail, the men were shown how to preach to a crowd without the assistance of mics and present the gospel clearly. Praise the Lord for his great grace. In our second week, we held a pastor's conference in the Jinja region of eastern Uganda. The conference was in Kabale, the village where Pastor Amos was reared as a boy. To reach Kabale, we traveled by dirt road for an hour and a half, and then dirt path for an additional hour and a half. The people were friendly beyond belief. However, they were in extreme poverty, living in grass huts with thatched roofs. Their outhouses were filled with bats and energetic lizards. In Jinja, we met Pastor Pison, with whom Pastor Amos' family attends church. A one-day Bible conference was held with an emphasis on salvation, eternal security, courage, and doctrinal foundations of the Christian life. This was well received. Ninety people, nine of which were pastors, attended. During the invitation, fourteen received salvation. 
The Lord willing, this church will continue to grow in grace and become a strong Baptist church in the future. During my final week in Uganda, the Lord brought me an unusual experience. On a Sunday night, I was preaching to a group of believers who did not have an established church. The service was well attended and ten people received Christ as their Savior. The church was so excited that souls were being saved that they asked us to go to the home of one of their community members. When we arrived at the house, they told me the resident of the home was named Lydia. As we sat in the front room, two people brought Lydia to us. She was in the final stages of AIDS. Although she had no strength, she said that she wanted to listen to the gospel. After I gave a clear presentation of the gospel, she gladly received Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. Lydia's salvation had a great influence on her community. Those who brought us to her house were thrilled that Lydia now had eternal life. There is joy that comes with salvation, and an overwhelming bliss when we consider what a new life and a new body truly mean. Our last week in Uganda was primarily spent with Pastor Amos and the Kampala Independent Life Baptist Church. Although this church was our base station and concentrated area of ministry, we went to five local schools and did door-to-door -door soul winning during the afternoon hours. This Muslim man listened to the gospel and received Christ. Also, a 78-year-old lady who was almost completely blind listened to the good news of salvation and accepted the Lord. We also had the privilege of leading our cab drivers to the Lord. Additionally, we held our final pastor's conference at Kampala Independent Life Baptist Church. Before the start of the second day of the conference, I experienced great pain from a kidney stone. Although I was unable to teach in the morning session, I thank the Lord that my partner Kevin Riley was more than capable of filling the gap. In the midst of great pain, the Lord gave me strength to teach and preach during the afternoon session. On the last Sunday, I preached a special service on baptism, explaining correct doctrine and the significance of identifying with Christ. Two days later, a pool was rented and a baptism service was held for the Kampala Independent Life Baptist Church. Eleven people followed the Lord in believer's baptism including the pastor and his wife. I baptize you, my brother, and God's servant, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised. Although Pastor Amos had people attending his church meetings, he did not have a local New Testament church established. Therefore, we held an ordination service and charged Pastor Amos to uphold the correct biblical truths which were given to him. The final service preached was directed to Pastor Amos, admonishing him to stay on the old time path. He was charged not to veer to the right or left in doctrine. At the close of the service, men called to preach laid hands on Pastor Amos and ordained him. In this reenacted picture, his wife wanted to be by his side. Please continue to pray for Pastor Amos as he endeavors to grow in grace while upholding God's word and winning Ugandan souls. Jesus Christ is right here. Yes, it is And I believe with me that the flock needs to know about the right here. If you not have the disinformation back to the flock, Finally, please let me give you some statistics regarding our time in Uganda. There were 29 preaching or teaching sessions given by me and 24 by Kevin Riley. 65 pastors were taught at three separate conferences. 565 students and teachers in primary, middle, and high schools received preaching. 341 were saved. 
52 people were saved in church services and conference preaching. 38 were saved in open air preaching. 59 were saved during individual soul winning and 11 baptisms were performed. All this was done to the glory of God. I would like to thank those who supported the trip to Uganda by sacrificially giving and sacrificially praying. This fruit is added to your account. May God continue to bless the work which is now in progress by Pastor Amos and other Ugandan pastors. Their work is continuing and adding fruit to the labor. I wish to give a special thanks to Bible Baptist Church in Grove City, Ohio and Warren Baptist Temple in Warren, Ohio for sacrificially giving for pastors' conferences, food, and land rental for Kampala Independent Life Baptist Church. In conclusion, let's revisit some of the Ugandan souls that have now been changed because of Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and take a couple minutes and I'll answer some questions for you. Yes. Well, we are we are working on that. Uh, they do have a translation in the Lugando language, and but they're expensive, and also the problem is is. The, the only place that Ron and I are aware of is a place down in South Africa. So it's over a thousand miles away for sure. So what we're trying to do now is to uh, concentrate on the younger generation because they learn English in school and they can read English. And so the best thing that we can do is to give them a Bible that we know for sure is right. We've done some research on the Lugando uh, Bible, and we can't really figure out where, um, what Greek text that it came from. I've talked to some of the missionaries over there, and they said it's kind of like in between um, the King James Bible and the New International Version. So, you know, something in that case is better than nothing if that's all they can speak. But if they do know English, let's get them the right thing. So what we're, what we're doing now is we're trying to find out, Ron has already um, got some Bibles for us that we can send them, but unfortunately, because he's such a new church, there's no place to send them. Um, and we don't want to send them and, and, and get the whole shipment lost, uh, because the government is very, uh, they're, they're not easy to work with at all. So yes, very good question. And uh, English would be just fine for them. Yes, Scott. How many, how many Christian uh, established over there right now? Well, there's quite a few established, but as I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, video, uh, the Pentecostal influence over there is stronger than what you can imagine. I mean, every single thing over there is 
you know, um, glory to God laundromat, um, just, you know, Jehovah Jireh uh, mechanics place, you know, it, it's, it's the, the influence of God is everywhere, but the people have no idea what it means. So when you start talking to them about biblical things, they have some understanding, but then if you get down to the details, rather than just believing in God or believing that there was a, a person named Jesus Christ, they don't really know. And because this uh, Pentecostal influence is so strong, it, ha it has gone completely out of control. Um, they're not preaching the gospel at all. It is an actual business that they are running. And there's a, there's a huge place over there. Um, tens of thousands of people uh, go to uh, uh, Ron's, Ron's Holy City, is what they call it. And he's on TV, and he's uh, got massive speakers, and people, they'll take their life savings, which isn't much, to get to his place to try and get healed, and people die there, and they just leave them there. And um, we were in downtown Kampala, which it's, it's a mess uh, traffic-wise. It's, it's horrible. And we see this humongous line of people, uh, a line of people for miles, and they're standing there with jugs in their hands. And uh, Amos, uh, Pastor Amos says, well, they're, they're waiting for holy water. And, you know, we, we think that's funny because it is, but the sad thing is, is they're, they're putting their eternity on that. And uh, so it's, it's just a real bad situation there. So to answer your question concerning the amount of churches, there were some churches that we worked with that we didn't know what they were, and they didn't know what they were. But they assured us that they wanted teaching from the Bible so that they could know. And that's what we did. Any other questions? Quentin? Did you eat good? Uh, we, we did. We did. We, we ate very well. Um, I don't know if you saw the picture where I was holding the rooster. And uh, what happened is uh, we went to one of the schools, and probably 85 to 90% of the students and the faculty got saved when I was done preaching. And they were so excited, they literally were begging us, please go into our village and tell the people in our village. So we started doing door-to-door -door soul winning. And I, I led this lady to Christ, and while I was in the middle of explaining the gospel, her daughter came in, and her daughter got saved as well. And so then afterwards, I find out that this lady has a chicken farm. And so she gave me this big rooster. Now listen to this. She gave me this rooster that was considered a full dowry. So they considered me the worth of their daughter. Well, then the next day, of course, I gave it to the local pastor. I mean, what was I going to do with it in my motel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, Brother Yoder, um, they really expect you to eat that. <laughs> and my wife is cooking it right now. I said, okay, lunchtime, we'll go to your house and we'll, we'll eat. So I had rooster for the first time. And it was in between chicken and turkey as far as size-wise. But, man, it was tough. I mean, that chicken must have been working out or something. <laughs> uh, but it had good flavor. So. <laughs> okay, anything else? All right, yes, ma'am. Well, what happened was um, it was only a couple weeks after we left and they were getting everything fully established that the devil got into the works. Um, we had a meeting with his landlord and we met him at the hospital because his wife was uh, close to death. She has since passed uh, unsaved. And um, we told him we would meet him at the hospital and so I presented to him the gospel, and 
after some great explanation, he received Christ as his Savior. And then we went to go talk to his wife, and as we began, she, she was not in any position to be able to um, listen for very long at all. And as soon as I started talking with her and everything, she just turned away and so forth, didn't, didn't want anything to do with it. And so we asked him about getting the land because it had two parts to it. And if he would have rented the first part of the land, they would have no access to be able to even get to his building. And we said, if, if we pay for a year's worth of rent up front, will you give us a discount? And we would also like to be able to get that land up front. And he said, absolutely no way. Now, they have shillings. So we were going to offer him, um, I don't know, I think we were going to offer him 150,000 shillings for rent. And he said, no, it was like a million point two. Well, two days later, he calls back. And he said, I talked with my dad. That land has all been inherited through five generations, and I didn't want to say anything until I talked to my father who was in his late 80s or something like that. And he said, um, we want to make a contract for a year and the front property as well for 150,000 shillings. So he gave us exactly what we had asked for and what we had prayed about. And then we also had a little bit of money left over to buy some iron sheets to cover up where the rain was coming in because it was coming in bad. And I know you could see how everybody was trying to huddle together. And, uh, but anyway, after that was all fixed up, they had put the, me the metal sheets on and everything, a government official shows up and says, this building right here, it's too close to this creek over here. You need to move it. And he, at this point in time, he only has like... Uh, three or four men in his church that can do work like that, and they're working other jobs, and one of them is a principal of a school, and so forth and so on. And so he, they had no way to move the building, and then they came back a second time and said, you either move it or we're tearing it all down. Uh, so that is one of the things that we're praying about now, because he needs a, about $1,000 to... Uh, have that building moved and put it forward on the land where it will meet the, uh, you know, the code. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Yes, Chuck. Oh, the main religion is Pentecostal religion. In, in uh, 1991, um, it was all run by Edi, uh, Edi Amin and he just ransacked his own people without mercy. And as soon as he was out of power then, the Pentecostals just zoomed in and took over the country. And uh, so now it's a mess. And Islam is picking up quite a bit over there as well. Yes, Terry Lynn. Eight different schools. Well, some they have a, um, like a primary school, um, a middle school, and a high school. And in the primaries, they start them at three years old. So some of the pictures you probably saw on the screen, there's very small kids. And of course, when we gave the invitation, their thing, they raised their hand, but we didn't count any of them. So the I mean, we had over 600 people raise their hand for professions of faith. But the closest that we could come up with as far as kids that knew what they were doing was 340. All right. Yes, yes, there, there is going to be follow-up, and there is follow-up. Um, since we've left there, the, uh, that Tony David, he's been into a school, and they've already led another 100 children to Christ. They've baptized 40 children. 
Um, the other, there was another principal there that was working with Amos uh, the, in the same village where I got the rooster. And um, what they're doing is they're having a Bible study after uh, Friday school. When, the, when parents come in to pick up their kids, Pastor Amos is there, and so he's teaching and preaching to the parents and to the children again. And the Lord has really been working things out because the bond between the principal of that school and Pastor Amos is getting stronger. And they are, of course, they're wanting more help, but they want to get it in the right way. And so that's a huge blessing. Okay. Well, they, a lot of them, yeah, it's primarily farming. They, Uganda is the food center for Africa. And so their agriculture is very, very strong. It's very, very good. They have a lot of rice. They have, their main thing over there is bananas and tea. They have bananas for everything. And that is, I mean, you have banana for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but they don't call it banana. What they do is they cook it inside leaves, and it, it, it's called matoki, but it's the inside of banana, and they stir it all together, and then they cook it, and then when it's done, it's like mashed potatoes. And it kind of tastes like mashed potatoes, too. It doesn't taste like bananas. Yes, Sandy. Uh, what about the honey problem over there? Quite a bit. Yeah, it's like the second or third highest country for AIDS in the world. So when I had the kidney stone, of course, I didn't know what was going on at the time. You know, I had fever, shakes, and just, you know, about ready to pass out. I thought, man, I don't want to go to the hospital for any reason at all because I don't want to come home with AIDS. So. But, yeah, uh, uh, I, think, I think the average age of dying or something like that is uh, less than 48 years old. So I was already considered an old man going over there. <laughs> well, let's get into some Bible study tonight. This will just be short. I won't hold you long. I'd like for you to turn to Psalms 40. And I, again, I do want to thank you for uh, sending me your financial support, your love, and your prayers. There's no way that I could have done that without you. But the Lord was so kind to me over there, and, and we saw so many blessings. Uh, I, I don't want to forget what happened over there. You know, that was, I always used to pray to the Lord and, and ask Him, Lord, I hear and I read about people that are willing to stand out in the rain to hear the gospel. Uh, could, could you send me to one of those places? And this is about as close to it as I got. Um, when, we were, when I had my kidney stone and I couldn't move, I'd roll down my window and I'd stick tracks out the window to people that were passing by. And all the little children would come by and they'd wonder what I was uh, doing and so I could talk to them. Uh, I mean, it's just so easy to witness to those people because you know, they're hungry for the truth. Amen. In Psalm chapter 40, let's go ahead and stand. We'll stretch for just a second. Psalms chapter 40, and we'll read verse 5. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Now let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your kindness to us, and I would ask, Lord, that you would use this message and your word uh, to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit of God, I need your power. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things going on in, in our uh, world right now at this time, and we sure would like to center in on the Bible. Thank you again for your kindness and your love, and uh, I'll give you the honor and praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. The Bible says here, many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works. 
So when we think about our lives, and this is David, he's reflecting back and he's saying, man, the, the wonderful works of God that he has done are, are many. But then he says something here that's pretty incredible. He says, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And what's he talking about here? He's talking about the thoughts that God has toward you. The title of my little message tonight is called Forgotten. Forgotten. He said, they are more than can be numbered. Well, what does that mean? Well, there's two things that are possible. Uh, you could either run out of time in your life and be dead before you could count them all up, or you could actually run out of our number system. Now, let me, get, let me explain that to you, okay? If, if, a, if a person could talk when they're born, okay, little Vanessa Rose that's going to be born by our daughter on Sunday, if she could start speaking, <laughs> as soon as she was born, and, and start saying right away, uh, glory to God, I have life. And she could just say something, every single second of her entire life, praising God and thanking Him for God's thoughts towards her, um, she would have 2,995,920,000 thoughts towards God. But God said they couldn't be numbered, and we actually put a number on that. Now... <clears throat> The, the greatest number that we know that has a name to it is what's called a Googleplex. A Google of numbers is uh, 10 to the 100th power. Okay, so it's 10 times 10 and then um, scientific no notation 100. That's what's called a Googleplex. After that, we don't have any names for the numbers. Okay? So, uh, a gazillion or, um, you know, something like that, that's not a real number. It's just something that somebody makes up when they're selling pizza. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> but God said if you could go that far, there's still even more than that. Now, Pastor mentioned that uh, there was... Uh, 48 specific prophecies concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. And if you take the things, those 48 prophecies, like where he was going to be born, um, what his name would be, Emmanuel, uh, the time when he was going to be born, all the particulars about Jesus Christ, uh, that would be more than 10 to the 157th power, which is more than electrons in the universe. So anybody that denies the Bible because of science, they're nuts, okay? They don't know what they're talking about. But God's telling us here that there are so many thoughts that He has towards you that they can't be numbered. Now, here's the thing for tonight. The question is that it's not God that's on trial. The question is, how about you? Please turn to chapter 9. Psalms chapter 9. And we're going to read two verses. Psalms chapter 9, beginning with verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. So here we have a forgotten nation or a nation that forgets God. Please keep your finger here or put a bookmarker here because we'll be right back here. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And let's read verse beginning with 37. Jesus said unto him, 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Now when it tells us here that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind, I wonder how much of yesterday America has forgotten God. Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. And yet there's houses all across America that had no place for Jesus. We're supposed to pray for America. We're supposed to pray for Israel. We're supposed to pray for reaching those in the 1040 window. A forgotten nation. Let's go back to Psalms chapter 9, please. It says in verse 18, For the needy shall not always be forgotten, The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. We read about a forgotten nation or a nation that forgets God. And we read about a forgotten people, the poor. Again, keep your finger here, but let's turn over to Proverbs. One book over, Proverbs chapter 17. Excuse me, chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. Verse 17, Proverbs 19, 17, the Bible says, He that hath pity upon the poor, what? Lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. A forgotten people. We forget about the poor. Now, I'm not talking about the people that you see on TV. I'm talking about your Christian brothers and sisters. And when you look up poor and and find out what this word actually means, it means poor, yes, like we're also thinking, but it's also talking about uh, physical and spiritual help and also needy and weak. There's very little emphasis on the financial part. In America, we think poor, can you pay my bills for me? That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about people that need help. We have people right here in our congregation that need spiritual help. Why? Because they're weak. That's why we have the RU ministry. That's why we have the jail ministry. New Christians. Some of you have been saved for 20, 30 years. You're so supposed to be strong in the Lord because supposedly you have grown in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But everybody that sits in here is not that way. They need help. Why? Because they're weak as Christians. Have you forgotten about that? We have a forgotten nation. We have forgotten people. But then we also have one other thing, and that's a forgotten mission. As a missionary... We are dealing with nations that have forgotten God. You see, the rest of the world has had the gospel and the truth before America has. Africa, Uganda, they had the gospel way before we did. Please turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and let's begin reading with verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. You see, when we fulfill the Great Commission, we can rejoice together because 
we have not forgotten what God told us to remember. We'll go to uh, two other places and we'll be finished. Go back to Psalms one more time. I hope your finger's still there. Mine isn't. I, I let it go. But Psalms chapter 9. Before the verse we read in Psalms chapter 9, we see verse 16. The last word there is Selah. We also see that, ver- that word at the end of, cha- uh, of verse 20, Selah. Now, it means more than just think about it. It means more than pause. It means more than the end of a musical notation. Yes, it means those things, but it's more than that. Every time you see that word in the Bible, the context is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the Bible's telling us uh, when it comes to forgetting certain things, don't forget that He's coming back. And one of the reasons that we're going to run out of time is because our Lord's going to return. So I want to encourage you tonight, thank you, Thank you, thank you for sending me to Uganda. Why? I'm going to answer that for you. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 18, we have the Great Commission. The Bible says in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Bible tells us here that we should be going into all the world and preaching the gospel To every creature. We just read in John chapter 4 that we can rejoice together because one was sowing the seed and the other was reaping the harvest. There is no way that I could have done what I was able to do in Uganda if you wouldn't have put the money in the plate so that I could go. We took the Gospel to those who have forgotten the one true God, for so long that they don't even know who God is. On their mechanic shop, when it says, uh, uh, mechanic shop Jehovah Jireh, they don't even know what that is. Reverend Harmon, back in the late 80s, I was in, uh, up at Canton Baptist Temple, my wife and I were there, and he used to always give this illustration. During the 60s, there were some, peop- some hippies that were mad at what was going on in the United States, and they blamed it all on religion and Jesus. So they said they were going to move to an island off the coast of uh, California. Well, 20 years later, they went back to talk to those people. And not one of the children of those hippies knew anything about the Bible and Jesus Christ. So how long does it take to get rid of the one true God and Jesus Christ the Savior? One generation. (laughs) So Uganda has been in darkness for a long, long time. But we've done what Christ asked us to do and give them the Gospel. We are helping the poor, listen, we're helping the poor through missions. Many of them are in physical poverty beyond what you can imagine. When we are there, we're helping them. They're not just excited because we're helping them spiritually. But you know, I I like to eat a little bit too. And when we're out who knows where, we go out to eat. And we pay for them. We don't tell them, no, you have to sit out in the dirt while I go in and eat. We, We pay for them. So they got to go out to eat more than they ever have in their life during the time I was there. Amos, the one that we talk about, who loves the Lord with all his heart, 
If you would go into the office area and remove the desk, that is the size of his entire house. He has one room, no indoor bath, no indoor shower, that's it. A family of four. Your missionaries are helping the poor, and you are helping them, and you are fulfilling what God said through those missionaries. We have not forgotten the mission because many are receiving eternal life because you sent missionaries to them. <laughs> Folks, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to pump you up tonight and say, boy, aren't you really good. No, I'm, I'm trying to give you some facts. We, we had, uh, in, this, in this past year, I made two trips to India and Uganda. We've had 376 students saved. We've had 180 that were saved during soul winning. We've had 23 that were baptized. Saved, baptized, over 400 pastors that received Bible teaching. That is the Great Commission. Dr. Yoder, is this working? Amen, it's working. Amen. And you are all part of it. You say, well, how, how's God going to divide that all up? Man, I have no idea. You'll have to ask the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that if he says, um, you will, if you give a cup of cold water in the name of one of my disciples, you will in no wise lose your reward. He was talking to that while his disciples were there on earth. He surely would be talking about his servants today. Less than that would be unjust. And our God is most certainly just. Hey, let me ask you a question before I turn everything back over to the pastor. Many of you in your life this year, you've had some unforgettable moments. And they were unforgettable because of God. Don't forget that. Many of you still are kind of like on the outside looking in. You're kind of wondering what this is all about. Why would some guy go to the other side of the world to do those things? And the answer is, you need to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're not 100% for sure when you die that you're going to go to heaven, get that taken care of. It's not hard. It's simple. Christ has done all the work. You just have to be willing to say, yes, I'm the guilty party. Jesus died for me. And it's, it's very simple because it's all by grace through Jesus Christ. Maybe this coming year you could do a little bit more. Maybe you could help a little more financially. Maybe you could spend a little more time in prayer. Without, without prayer, I couldn't do anything when I would get over there. I'd have so many walls, I wouldn't be able to overcome anything. A lot of time is spent in prayer about these trips. But we can see time after time again, God blesses because that's what he wants. He wants us to fulfill his will. Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness, and Lord, we totally give all the honor and glory to thee for what has happened this past year and certainly in this past trip to Uganda. I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that they're still maybe not sure that they're saved or they've been having some questions about that, or even in their service for the Lord, that they would get that taken care of tonight because we know that your return is very close. Help us not to forget to pray for America. Help us not to forget to pray for Israel. And help us not to forget to pray for one another. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.